This is a presentation made to the League of Aviation Historians about our book, Handley Page, 0400 Night Bomber Pilot. And here's the organisational uh, chart, and uh, you can pause that if you want to read where it's, uh, where it's going. So my parents start, first started uh, doing research, and in the family we had a death plaque uh, presented to the family of the fallen at the end of World War One, and uh, my sister discovered a photograph of him in school in 1908. After my parents passing uh, we continued doing uh, research and uh, this is where I am in the family. I am his uh, great niece. Gary was born in the Hitchin workhouse his father was the master of the workhouse, his mother the matron, and uh, they died, and so he was an orphan by 1912. And so he went on to another school, then he went to London to become an electrical engineering student at the Regent Street Polytechnic. And from there, he joined the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserves, training as a wireless telegrapher. And from there, he wanted to do pilot training and uh, become a pilot in the Royal Naval Air Service. So somewhere in there is the only picture we have of, of Gary, and we just have no idea which one he is. We have other documentation from his school magazine in a uh, race as an 11-year-old uh, newspaper as he left school. Uh, showing that he was one of few who matriculated. And we then go on to the research, and most of the significant research was done at the National Archives in Kew, uh, just outside of uh, central London. An enormous repository of historical documents, and some of them have been retained, managed to be kept, from being on active service a uh, hundred years ago. And if you order them in advance, you get them in a locker, in boxes, and uh, the research is just very easily easy. You can do some online, uh, which means you don't have to pay the fee for them uh, to download and send you the material. And there's uh, a reading room, an extensive reading room, and. I've never been there when it's been absolutely packed. And what did we uh, research in particular? Uh, squadron operation orders. This is one which shows um, night bomber squadrons and their targets and alternates. There are also mission reports where the intelligence officer was writing down uh, the reports from the air crew as they returned noting a variety of, uh, of material. And so we go back and we look a little bit about uh, World War I in Europe. The Gary story is about the Western Front, uh, stretching from Ostend in Belgium on the English Channel down to Switzerland. Uh, the northern part of the Western Front was trench warfare and the RFC, Royal Flying Corps, uh, did reconnaissance uh, bombing and pursuit of enemy aircraft and the Royal Naval Air Service did a lot of work on, on the coast initially with their flying programs. So there was public outrage in Britain with Zeppelin and Gotha bombing raids and the uh, RAF was established 1st of April from the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Squadron. Uh, there were leadership squab squabbles and uh, General Trenchard in initially resigned, but on the establishment of an independent force, uh, he would take over the leadership. And these were some of the um, RFC fighters that were in use at the time. So. The independent force, Trenchard, was answerable only to the Air Ministry, not through the Royal Air Force itself. 
originally had five squadrons and increased to nine by August of 1918. And the area of operation, uh, we are going to look at the left-hand side French border with Alsace-Lorraine and the independence force was centered in Nancy. And on the right-hand uh, picture, you see the bombing squadrons and where they were based. And a list here of uh, how the independence force evolved from five squadrons, one being a handling page, and going on to nine in August 1918 uh, with five handling page squadrons. <laughs> So the independent force mandate was to mobilize strategic targets, industrial centers, and uh, the produced armaments, etc. Um, Trenchard concentrated on tactical targets, airfields, and railways. And here is a list of uh, the types of targets that they they did and that they were involved with. So high altitude night bombing was very inaccurate. Uh, crews were required to bomb at low level. And so there was going to be a larger loss at lower altitudes. The Handley Page was designed and as uh, one of the people at the time described it, they wanted a bloody paralyzer. And originally the 0100 uh, was designed, only about four dozen uh, were produced, and then it was improved with larger engine and a few other features to the 0400. One contemporary pilot describes it as being like a lorry, a truck in the air. When you decided to turn left, you pushed over the controls, went and had a cup of tea, and came back to find the turn just starting. And here's some damage that um, aircraft could sustain, but still return uh, to their home bases with large amounts of some damage. Um, some statistics. So here, um, with a 100-foot wingspan, so that means that you could get three side by side down the length of uh, a soccer field, a football field. And to get an idea about the height, uh, the scale of a person with uh, the, uh, the front cockpit and the engine nacelle at the 0400. And then we have a cutaway that's uh, in the book. Um, thank you to those allowing us to use them. Uh, they are copyright, so you can't. Uh, and indeed this one with the, uh, the cockpit instruments. And so Gary was uh, night, sorry, 18 years old, reading recruitment posters, living in London uh, at uh, Crystal Palace and seeing recruitment posters like this and he joined the Royal Naval Voluntary Reserves and he did wireless tele telegraphy there and he was based at Crystal Palace which was known as HMS uh, Crystal Palace and then he decided he wanted to transfer to the Royal Naval Air Service as pilot. So he wrote to his headmaster asking for a character reference and this letter only came to light about a year ago so so is a gem and the last paragraph said I should like to write more but I've heaps of washing to do and I'm not a dab hand yet. Uh, so um, reality strikes as well. And there's a newspaper record of his appointment as a probationary flight officer in the Royal Naval Air Service. He went on to Manston for initial 
training, further training at, at Cranwell. And left Cranwell, you can see Manston, uh, the bottom right, and Cranwell, not quite halfway up England, um, uh, for flight training, and he left Cranwell with 55 hours of, of flight. He then moved on to Netherraven, uh, where he was doing 0400 uh, transition training. And then to Andover, only a few miles away, where he joined 215 Squadron. It's a picture of, of uh, Netherraven, uh, which is near Stonehenge, but isn't the Stonehenge Airport. There was one even closer to, to the, those magnificent stones. And here's a, a, a picture of uh, Andover Airfield. Uh, and again, other information, uh, newspaper article noting his temporary commission as a second lieutenant in the Royal Naval Air Service. And at the National Archives, uh, quite a few forms, records. This one here notes his transfer to 215 Squadron. And so he was deployed uh, to, on the uh, 7th of July to Alkeen in northern France, uh, which is about 10 miles from both Boulogne and Calais on the northern French coast. And he did a number of missions, uh, eight at Alkeen, then moved in August to Zafavillias further south, and um, uh, one raid on the uh, 15th and 16th of September, he returned with a plane with quite a lot of damage, but again was able to return to, to his home base. And so he did eight flights at Alkeen, 13 at Zafavillias, and his 13th flight, he was in a new airplane, had two brand new aircrew, second lieutenants uh, Clement Eves and John Ferguson, for whom it was their first mission. And uh, he took off at 8.08 p.m. And so we're imagining uh, 80 miles north, he must have been there about 2100, 9 p.m. And uh, other planes that went there noted uh, heavy anti-aircraft um, artillery. And so um, he didn't return, but there weren't any records in the mission reports of the other pilots as to the, whether they'd seen anything or not. Uh, so here's a list of, of Gary's missions. Uh, if you look at the, the map on the right, the top three around Alkeen when he was based near, near the coast, and then the last 13 were uh, towards the uh, south eastern end of the uh, front line, the western front. So there was a, an amount of equipment that was needed. The clothing was needed for high altitude where it was cold. Early flight clothing, if you remember pictures of the Wright brothers and a few after, at lower altitudes almost wearing just normal clothing. But these were insulated and they were developed to be the all-in-one Sidcot suit, several layers of um, insulation uh, because it could go down to um, minus 35 degrees uh, Celsius, close to that Fahrenheit, at about 6,000 feet. Uh, and then what they might have personally taken with them, chocolate bar, map case for the navigator, and uh, uh, an officer's torch, uh, will go with flashlight. And then uh, some of the uh, 
anti-aircraft artillery on the left, uh, the flak uh, gun, and below that, uh, the revolving cannon with, with uh, 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 several barrels. Um, that is really, it's been nicknamed the light splitter. And they produced flaming green onions. Um, and we'll hear later that uh, how other people were, were seeing those. But originally they thought that they were joined, these um, artillery shells were joined by wire. And at the bottom you've got a uh, machine gun nearly pointing upwards and it's probably thought that is what will have brought um, Gary down on September the 20th. Um, and so what do the Handley Page um, aircraft have? Uh, so in the cockpit they've got a Lewis gun on a scarf ring uh, the navigator could uh, move uh, into that forward cockpit, pilot sitting behind um, with a Lewis gun, another Lewis gun amidships with the gun layer. And they would have been dropping, and certainly Gary's uh, missions involved um, a number of the 25 pounders and uh, equal larger number of 112 pound. Um, high explosive delayed de detonation bombs. He, though other uh, 0400s carried the uh, 1650 pound bomb, um, he didn't. And on this picture, you can see a trail of uh, five lights going upwards, which would have been your, your flaming green onions amongst the, the searchlight. Uh, to assist aircrew returning, uh, there were a series of lighthouses, these beacons, and they were placed uh, on a stretch maybe of about 30 miles and uh, 15 to 20 kilometers, uh, so about 10 to 14 miles behind the front lines with recognizable flashing of Morse code. ABC FGH. So if you could identify which side of C you were, you knew where you were and uh, what your uh, trajectory should be for returning to your home base. Um, and here we've got uh, drift sites to help the, um, uh, the bomb aiming and at a high altitude, even allow, even using these, allowing for everything that uh, would disrupt the travel of the bomb downwards. On the Hanley Page um, cockpit there at the front, it's right at the front. So the navigator observer was using uh, a drift sight there. And in, I think that's a, a DH-4, um, a drift sight on the side of the airplane by, by the pilot. Um, and they also used very pistols as uh, giving um, messages to, to others and they were color coded and so you could uh, send messages as you were coming back that you were friend not foe. So in writing, researching the book, uh, a commemoration. So the books are donated, um, none, none are sold. Um, constituted about two years work, um, not full time, having 1500 books printed in the US, shipped uh, 1200 to the UK and uh, wanted them to be in the UK for the 100th anniversary of his death. Uh, so uh, in the first week that we were there, distributed about a thousand of them to Brooklyn's uh, Aviation and Automotive Museum. Hearts at War, Hitchin where he was born is in Hertfordshire, so Hearts at War. Um, the Shuttleworth Trust, which flies uh, an amazing collection of, of aircraft. I saw a renovated SE5 flying last time I was there. Uh, Imperial War Museums, Duxford and London, and then to Stockport where one of the aircrew came from. 
And then uh, some other books we took to France. So for the anniversary of his death, uh, we were actually the location that he took off and the, uh, the airfield where uh, he was lost over. Um, so Frescati and Zaffervilliers. Uh, Zaffervilliers is near Nancy and about 80 miles to the north, slightly northwest, you have Frescati, which was the target aerodrome. Um, looking at Zaffervilliers first, um, the numbers here uh, outline the perimeter. And we're going to start off with, with number one at the top and uh, the church. There happens to be a postcard that was actually from 1915. And we were there virtually the same aspect in 2018. And as you go around the airfield and on the inset, you can just see which orientation uh, we're looking and where we are compared. Very much farmland. Uh, it will have been tamed farmland when um, when uh, uh, Gary was uh, was there. And uh, number three, looking at a T junction again, uh, centre ahead across the airfield. Um, pretty nice flat looking surface for it. And then several more around here. When they were building them uh, in these cemeteries, there are Indian labourer uh, graves um, because a whole variety of people and engineers were building them and some of them needed um, uh, drainage as well. Uh, and you'll see all the trees to the left hand side uh, which is fairly significant uh, because in those trees uh, that's where the huts uh, were camouflaged um, on the side of the airfield, uh, but now very much farmland and we were very lucky to be able to go across the uh, airfield um, with the mayor's wife as our guide. Uh, we had cold called at the um, town hall, uh, but because it's a small village, uh, they're only open sort of two lunch times in an evening but we were told how to find the mayor. And we arrived with some books and uh, the signed print and um, mm -hmm. uh, Madame Clement on the left there uh, kindly invited us in till her husband arrived and uh, equally kindly took us on a tour because I'm sure we never would have driven across the center of the airfield. Here are some huts uh, that um, are long since gone but that's how they, they uh, would have looked in um, World War I. And uh, that's what Gary would have seen as he left his hut in, in the morning. Uh, so again, we're uh, right down in the bottom corner and the end of the trail out of the, the airfield. So a little bit of squadron history here. Um, it was a Royal Naval Air Squadron to begin with and um, formed in March just before uh, the establishment of the uh, Royal Air Force and they were based at Kudakirk uh, which is pretty close to Alkeen where um, Gary went to and there are several other airfields uh, around there just because of its proximity to uh, really one of the, the busiest parts of the uh, Western Front. And in night operations, 215 Squadron dropped 167 tons of ordnance and um, Interestingly, the British uh, lost an aircraft for every three, just under four tons of bombs dropped. The French, it was eight and a half tons of bombs dropped. Um, 215 Squadron, it was 1.95. They had horrendous loss rates. 
And here we have a table uh, for the independence force showing that 69 aircraft uh, are lost, is the Handley page. Um, considering there are five uh, squadrons, each with 10 aircraft, uh, they're being replaced at um, really quite a, quite a high rate. And 215 uh, squadron personnel losses in September, 93% were lost. Um, we go from there to uh, Frescati Aerodrome, the uh, target of Gary's last mission. Uh, it had been a target of the French Air Force. It had been the target of other night squadrons uh, before the 20th as well. And the 20th was, was moonlit. And the airfield area is about 10 miles southwest of Metz. And again, a picture showing uh, the one on the right, uh, Zaffa Villiers and Frescati, about 80 miles apart. So we've got the, the airfield south of Metz. Um, the pictures on, on there are uh, the views of the, the, the airfield, the direction that uh, we were looking in when we took the pictures, and the one with wings are slightly aerial uh, uh, photographs. So here, we're at the north end, almost looking straight down um, through the runway. And uh, as you're looking in that direction, you would see the back end of this uh, building, which is known as the Casino de Frescati, characteristic, well-known uh, building on the, um, what was then the, the airfield, right next door to the Zeppelin hangar that was built there on the on the right side, you can see some of the hangars, but there was a, a big parade of, of, of hangars there. In fact, you can see some of them here in a, in a very old uh, uh, postcard. Uh, when we went to, um, to get to this, this airfield, which was a um, Cold War French Air Force airfield uh, with a, a metal full uh, runway, um, which had closed in uh, 2011. Again, we went to the uh, mayor's office and cold called. Uh, but again, we're very lucky with the books and a print. And um, again, because um, uh, we got a relative who, who was lost, uh, they were very respectful. And uh, as we were at the mayor's office talking with his assistant, the, the mayor came in and uh, she much more rapidly and better um, described what I'd been saying to the mayor and he just said, make it so. So they called up the director of the airfield, uh, who was ex-Air uh, Force, French Air Force Colonel Philippe Alexandre, who um, gave us again, uh, a tour that um, really was, wouldn't have been possible uh, without um, the assistance of, in fact, both, both mayor's offices. So we're looking uh, down one of the more modern taxiways, uh, the main runway, and uh, we're again on the north corner, what would be looking at the back of the Zeppelin hangar and the runway on the other side of the Zeppelin hangar. Um, and uh, on the east side of the airfield, you actually have some excavations of uh, World War I buildings that were there. So that, that was done uh, several years ago, um, uh, quite interestingly. And here is a more uh, contemporaneous uh, picture showing the um, Zeppelin hangar and indeed the Casino de Casa uh, Frescati from an airplane. You can just see the wing, the wing that's there. Um, and here is a 1918 aerial view. So none of that modern runway that you can see taxiways and well-worn paths. And there's a little chevron there. And what enabled a lot of the location um, is that the Fort Saint-Privat, 
that is there. Um, it's in uh, somewhat ruins, but that is was adjacent to the row of um, hangars and at, above it, slightly above it, halfway between it and the north end, um, you've got the Zeppelin hangar. Now we're going to look at, at some personnel. Um, on this page are the three air crew. So on the left, Gary, no, no picture of him. And um, he was um, uh, described by uh, one of his, his colleagues as a pilot. He was superb, among the best I've ever had the pleasure to fly with as an observer. And he was a brave aviator and a gentleman, hence the name on the front of the book as well. Um, and he was flying. He was 19 years and three months old. He was flying uh, with... Uh, a 23 year old um, Clement Cloth Eves from Stockport, just south of Manchester, uh, working as an engineer, uh, volunteered and, and joined up. And he'd arrived at the squadron nine days before. This was his first uh, active mission. And on the right, there is a picture of John Shannon Ferguson. Uh, he'd emigrated to the United States, to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, uh, from Howick in just above the uh, Scottish border uh, with England. Um, and again, he was uh, the gun layer, and it was his first mission too. And on this page, we have two Canadians. The, the top one, uh, Hugh Monaghan, actually came from 216 Squadron, and... Um, he describes here uh, about his last flight uh, when he crash landed and uh, behind en enemy lines uh, was taken prisoner of war. And his chief worry was falling into the hands of farmers or other civilians. They hated night bombers who they looked upon as killers of women and children and were known to pitchfork them to death. Um, and he wrote a book... Um, show you that on the next slide. And uh, Second uh, Lieutenant Sanchin Goodfellow was a Canadian, and his granddaughter and grandson in law live in Saskatchewan. And he has uh, indeed written a book about uh, his uh, grandfather in law. And uh, uh, Samson Goodfellow witnessed. Uh, a visit from General Trenchard and uh, described it that he gave the 215 air crew hell. He swore at us, called us liars, and said we dropped bombs in fields near our objective and came back with stories that not, were not true. When he called us liars, I thought he meant me. That same evening, uh, flying in bad weather, he got lost and the pilot suggested turning for home and he said, no, no English devil is going to call me a liar or say I'm a coward. So keep going. Um, and this is the, uh, the book that uh, uh, Hugh Monaghan uh, wrote. And then there is um, uh, Jack Lacey, who uh, we met the uncle of Jack Lacey last year as well and had a... Just a great sharing of uh, what information that, that we had. Um, and uh, he's recounting here um, on landing, uh, he was watching an uh, uh, aircrew, another flight coming back, and it careened into the airfield petrol store, killing Captain G.S. Buck. Um, Buck was had a DFC, and uh, was a, a wing commander, and his loss was felt very deeply by 215 Squadron. And this old hand was 21 years of age. And below is Roy Schillinglaw, who actually was at 100 Squadron, but they shared the airfield at Saffa Villiers. And he's just saying here that he didn't think anyone was 
uh, deliberately bombing civilians. And uh, he says uh, a visit um, after uh, a squadron fatality um, that will be with uh, Box and Inch. Um, and uh, Trenchard came and sat on his stick, because he had a walking stick, and said, gather round, it's unfortunate, just getting a new machine, and this happens. And this, that, uh, Schilling law extemporizes. But there are, nevertheless, there are plenty more pilots, plenty more observers, plenty more machines in the pool. Get cracking. My targets have got to be bombed. And then we look at one of the early members of 215 Squadron, uh, Paul Buescher, and uh, he came down in the English Channel um, on a mission to uh, Zeebrugge. His pilot uh, drowned, and uh, the plan for that evening says the idea was like this. From 10 o'clock till 1 a.m., machines will be uh, bombing, bombing Zeebrugge, Mole, and batteries incessantly. As one machine finishes, the other will carry on. And that's really what Gary was experiencing um, on the night um, that he died and on previous nights. Uh, several planes would, would go to the same target and follow each other in and often do several circuits. Um, and um, uh, Paul uh, Buescher here um, notes about the... Um, flaming green onions, green glowing balls which twisted about like live things and seemed to chase an airplane, turning over and end on end in a leisurely way. And he wrote a book uh, called Great Balls, oh, sorry, Green Balls, The Adventures of a Night Bomber. And uh, finally, the um, mini bio that we're going to look at is William Chalkling. And... Um, it's um, describing there his uh, first night raid as, as a gun layer with Buell Aerodrome and saying what he sees, what he experiences, and then returns again uh, at 1.50 a.m. Um, and again, drop bombs at 300 feet um, on another mission. And what happened... Uh, last year, uh, was that his great uncle produced a daily blog, a hundred years to the day, from the journal of William John Chalkline. And uh, I've just picked out Monday, September the 2nd, because he flew that night uh, with Gary, Gary as pilot. He'd arrived the day before, he'd slept on the floor of a hut, and uh, then the next night he was he was out flying. And here is from the squadron history. Uh, they pick out a number of of pilots, and the bottom one here, uh, Second Lieutenant A C G Fowler, responsible for many excellent low bombing raids. His average height from which he bombed upon eight ex consecutive occasions was three hundred and sixty feet. And so after uh, his accident, uh, there's some paperwork that goes round. So uh, International Red Cross card, because all that his squadron knew was that he was missing in action. And so in Switzerland, the International Red Cross get information uh, from uh, both uh, the uh, British allies and from uh, the Germans through Charlottenburg. And the bottom line here, the grave is in the military cemetery of Metz. And there are next of kin cards and um, other details, which um, this one has killed, stamped when uh, it was known. His local newspaper um, uh, reports him, him killed and there's one section saying his grave is in the military cemetery of Metz, marked so that it can be found by the family. And the one on the right is from 
um, his friend on the squadron, uh, they shared a hut together and he's the one who um, noted that um, he was one, one of the most popular chaps here and uh, one of the best pilots that he'd known and he was a brave aviator and a gentleman. So we should have a grave but we don't and the Commonwealth War Graves did magnificent work and actually still continue to do that work. Um, but uh, there is an article in uh, the Regent Street Polytechnic magazine uh, about a letter they received um, from Germany and this was in um, uh, 1920 and they'd got a packet containing pocketbook letters, a certific certificate of the polytechnic classes, which is how they knew where to return it, and the pilot's certificate in the flying corps. And so uh, the le letter went on to say, he was sent to bombard Metz. I was standing at my post when I saw him landing. Um, and I think that's probably crash landing or coming down. The same moment I heard a fearful explosion. When I was able to get near, I found him dead under his airplane. So he probably had the documentation on, on his body. So they knew who he was. Did they know his crew of Eves, uh, their names, Eves and Ferguson? We will never know. So uh, we think that Metz Garrison Cemetery is his most likely resting place, but there's no uh, gravestone there. There was nothing that the uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission could follow up with. It was just after the San Mihail Offensive, six weeks before the armistice, and um, the uh, German forces must have been in retreat. Any temporary marking might have been lost. Um, so Fowler, Eves and Ferguson are commemorated on the Arras Flying Services Memorial uh, to the Missing. And so um, if we look at uh, the cemeteries here, um, there's Metz and just slightly to the north of it, um, but probably 10 miles from Frescati Airdrome, um, there's this Chambier. Um, and we were there just after dawn um, on one of our days. And indeed, there are some Commonwealth War graves. Um, these two airmen died on the 15th of September, 2018. So um, under a week before Gary did. And f f uh, any of the um, Air Force from whichever side were very respectful of the dead of the other and gave, gave, them, gave them burials. And so here are some, some French graves at Chambier, um, even some German ones, although they did move a number of German graves. And I kept wondering if, with the, all the reinterment that was done, if they'd actually thought that Gary, Clem and John uh, were German and had been moved somewhere else. Um, but there, I haven't tracked down any, any records with that. Uh, another possibility, I think my father thought this was a possibility, the one right at the bottom, um, Fay German Cemetery. Um, so behind some low walls and what we have here, just a number of metal crosses, a large number of metal crosses, and then um, some flagstones with unknown graves. Um, I can imagine that is a possibility as well. But until we get more documentation somehow, uh, probably from the German side, um, we're not going to know. And continuing with, with the story, uh, part of the commemoration was uh, to commission a, an oil painting, uh, which we did with uh, quite a well-known uh, aviation artist Neil Hipkiss and so that had to be done a good two years before uh, I think even before we really knew we were going to end up with a book and um, 
I had to give it a lot of time for the whole process to uh, to work its way through. Um, and it makes the book as you hold it. It's a memorial, the flight, Gary's last flight with the Zeppelin hangar and the Casino de Frescati in there and a few green onions, uh, flaming green onions to be to boot. Um, we called it In Roaring They Shall Rise, uh, which is part of uh, the poem The Kraken by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And in roaring they shall rise and on the surface die. So for anyone interested to find out more who hasn't got a copy of the uh, hard copy of the book, uh, there's a free ebook. So being uploaded EPUB and it nearly follows the same formatting as, as the book. Um, so the, these are the free ones. If any of them charge, go, go to another one and, and try that. Uh, sadly, Amazon isn't on there. Um, they charge for, depending on the size of the file, and they haven't yet zeroed it. Um, but hopefully in time, uh, it'll be on Amazon Kindle for nothing, as opposed to the two ninety nine that it is. So that's our, uh, our commemoration um, 100 years on. Uh, there's still memorials that are there. In Arras, uh, about 150 miles northwest of Metz, uh, there's the Faubourg Damien Cemetery, uh, which has the Flying Services Memorial uh, to the missing uh, uh, there as well. And on the uh, lower picture there that you see, Gary's name is on the back face, the one that we can't see on the side of the Remembrance Stone, uh, which says their name liveth forever evermore, and on the side that's pointing towards the, the, the graves of the Faubourg Cemetery. And um, interestingly, on that face, their names, just because of where they are in the alphabet, are that close to each other. In Gary's hometown, He's on the War Memorial in Hitchin, uh, which sort of nestles uh, in the shadow of St Mary's Church. And on the centenary of the armistice, uh, thousands attended uh, ceremonies um, all over, all over Britain. And uh, but there were thousands that attended the one in in uh, in Hitchin and the surrounding towns and and villages. Um, uh, that's there. In his school, this is Hitchin Grammar School, there's a magnificent um, stained glass window. And on the left hand one, the bottom panel is, as you can just see, the insert at the top left there with ACG Fowler. Um, so this school um, will actually have lost. Um, uh, at least 30 boys who, young men, who um, went off to war. Uh, his uh, college, Regent Street Polytechnic, um, mm. on Regent Street in London, uh, also has a roll of honour in marble um, in uh, their hallway. And you also have Royal Naval Air Service, one church which is at the end of nearly the end of a runway of the current uh, Royal Naval uh, Air Station, um, put uh, poppy leaves onto a propeller um, for the names of all the Royal Naval Air Service personnel who died. Um, and thanks to Steve George for, for getting that underway. Gary's uh, air crew. One of them is uh, commemorated at Stockport, which has an art gallery or war memorial. The lower picture shows as you go in, the far side is very much an internal war memorial, but on either side and upstairs, um, 
It's a living building with art exhibits that are there. And indeed, Clem Eaves is on the Royal Air Service list and commemorated. I haven't got John Ferguson. He is on a scroll in uh, Howick in uh, Scotland. And I haven't got records of that because it's in the Howick archives and uh, yet to track down. Uh, so there, um, information contained, and there's obviously so much more. Thank you for listening.